Our text this morning is the book of Judges, chapter 1. Now, after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall be the first to go up for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Indeed, I have delivered the land into his hand. So Judah said to Simeon, his brother, Come up with me to my allotted territory, that we may fight against the Canaanites, and I will likewise go with you to your allotted territory. And Simeon went with him. Then Judah went up, and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand, and they killed 10,000 men at Bezek. And they found Adonai Bezek in Bezek, and fought against him, and they defeated the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Then Adonai Bezek fled, and they pursued him, and caught, and caught him, and cut off his thumbs and big toes. And Adonai Bezek said, Seventy kings with their thumbs and big toes cut off, used to gather scraps under my table, as I have done. So God has repaid me. Then they brought him to Jerusalem, and there he died. Now the children of Judah fought against Jerusalem and took it. They struck it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. And afterward the children of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites, who dwelt in the mountains in the south and in the lowland. Then Judah went, up, went against the Canaanites who dwelt in Hebron, now the name of Hebron was formerly Kirjath Arba, and they killed Shishai, Ahiman, and Talmai. From there they went up against the inhabitants of Deber. The name of Deber was formerly Kirjath Sefer. Then Caleb said, whoever attacks Kirjath Sefer and takes it to him, I will give my daughter Aksa as wife. And Othniel, the son of Canaz, uh, Caleb's younger brother, took it. So he gave him his daughter Aksa as wife. Now it happened when she came to him that she urged him to ask her father for a field. And she dismounted from her donkey, and Caleb said to her, What do you wish? So she said to him, Give me a blessing, since you have given me land in the south, give me also springs of water. And Caleb gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. And the children of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, went up from the city of Palms with the children of Judah into the wilderness of Judah, which lies in the south near Arad. And they went and dwelt among the people. And Judah went with his brother Simeon, and they attacked the Canaanites who inhabited uh, Zephath, and it utterly destroyed him. So the name of the city was called Hormah. Also Judah took Gaza with its territory, Ashkelon with its territory, and Ekron with its territory. So the Lord was with Judah, and they drove out the mountaineers, but they could not drive out the inhabitants of the lowland, because they had chariots of iron. And they gave Hebron to Caleb, as Moses had said. Then he expelled from there the three sons of Anak. But the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who inhabited Jerusalem. So the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. And the house of Joseph also went up against Bethel, and the Lord was with them. So the house of Joseph sent men to spy out Bethel. The name of the city was formerly Luz. And when the spies saw a man coming out of the city, they said to him, Please show us the entrance to the city, and we will show you mercy. So he showed them the entrance to the city, and they struck the city with the edge of the sword. But they let the man and all his family go. And the man went to the land of the Hittites, built a city, and called this name Luz, which is its name to this day. However, Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shean and its villages, or Tanakh and its villages, or the inhabitants of Dor and its villages, or the inhabitants of Ibleam and its villages, or the inhabitants of Megiddo and its villages. For the Canaanites were determined to dwell in the land. And it came to pass when Israel was strong that they put the Canaanites under tribute, but not completely drive them out. Nor did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites who dwelt in Gezer. So the Canaanites dwelt in Gezer among them. Nor did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants of Kitron or the inhabitants of uh, Nahakul. Uh, so the Canaanites dwelt among them and were put under tribute. Nor did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Akko or the inhabitants of Sidon or of Alab, Oxib, Helba, Afik, or Rehob. So the Asherites dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. Nor did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, or the inhabitants of Beth Anath, but they dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land. Nevertheless, the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and Beth Anath were put under tribute to them. And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountains, for they would not allow them to come down to the valley. And the Amorites were determined to dwell in Mount Heres, in Aijalon, and in Shalbim. Yet when the strength of the house of Joseph became great, they were put under tribute. Now the boundary of the Amorites was from the ascent of Akrabim, from Selah, and upward. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're gathered as your people to hear your word. Would you prepare our hearts to faithfully receive your word? Plow the rough ground, water the parched earth, plant the seed deep, and bless us with the hundredfold harvest of your word. We praise things in your Son's name, and amen. 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 
Well, so um, we are kicking off a new series here. We're going to be working through the, the book of Judges. Uh, ben Zorns earlier suggested the title, Jumping Into Judges, for the whole series. We'll, we'll maybe wait on that. Um, I, I am uh, anxious to uh, dive into this. It looks like a lot of fun. Um, Judges is uh, a tricky book. There'll probably be some awkward moments, but we'll, we'll go on through. Um, I did put, this is for a, a new first, that I put uh, um, my actual notes in, in the back. Um, so you have a little bit more than what was in your bulletin. And I included in that an attempt to photocopy a map, which came out as a very helpful gray blob. Um, I, I, I noticed there's an impulse to sit there and try to go like this on it so you can see stuff. But I think you can still get a few things out of it. And hopefully that will orient you as we're, um, as we're working through uh, the text here. It does help to kind of be able to see the land and understand it a little bit as, as we're moving along. Um, so let's, let's dive right on in. Um, the, the text of Judges does not tell us who the author of this book is. We're not told uh, who authored it. Rabbinic tradition assigned the book of Judges to Samuel, um, which, to be honest, actually seems like a really strong possibility and would probably be my, my pick. Uh, it makes the most sense. There's a few time markers in the text. You know, you see a number of places where um, cities are, are, we get both their, their Canaanite name and then now what they've been renamed under the Israelites. So you get that sense that you're right at this moment of uh, transition. Um, you get also time markers like um, in, in 2125, it says, in those days they had no king which if you think about it for a moment, implies that the book of Judges was actually written down after there was a king in Israel. In those days, they had no king, implying it's composed at a moment where they do have a king, but early, early on, because they still remember the Canaanite names of all the city, cities. Um, you read in, in chapter 20, verses 27 and 28, it says, in those days, the ark was there, and there uh, refers to the city of Bethel. So the author is writing a time when the ark has moved on from Bethel. The next place it was was in Shiloh, where Eli and Samuel ministered uh, to the ark. So it does seem like it's right in that time period, around uh, the period that, that Samuel, um, was, uh, Samuel was, was acting as a prophet. Um, the, the book of Judges covers the period of time when Israel was governed by judges, hence the, hence the name. Uh, you, if you remember in the book of Ruth, the very first line uh, in, the, in the book of Ruth, chapter uh, 1, verse 1, it says, Now it came to pass in those days when the judges uh, ruled, or, or literally it would be in the judging of the judges. So, uh, so this is an actual defined moment in the history of Israel, this period where the judges uh, judged. It extends roughly from the death of Joshua, that's kind of the beginning of the period of the judges, to, I would say, the anointing of Saul, which would mean that it actually includes the ministry of Eli um, and of Samuel, at least the early days of Samuel. It would include that inside the, that period of the judges. Um, if you, at the beginning of Samuel, Eli is referred to as, as a judge uh, in Israel. Um, so the book of Judges then covers most of the period of the judging of the judges, but it's, it ends just a little bit before because Samuel picks up the very conclusion of it. Um, what, what is a judge? What do we mean when we say um, a judge or when a judge ruled in Israel? We tend to think of a judge as simply one who makes court decisions, uh, one, one who, who um, weighs out difficult cases and makes a decision under those circumstances. And that was certainly one element of the position. If you think in, in Judges 4 is where we have that description of Deborah, and it says that she, she would sit under a palm tree and people would bring difficult cases to her for her to adjudicate. Um, and so that classic sense of a judge, certainly that is a part of what it meant to be a judge. But it also described more than just that. It was a, a national or at the very least a tribal or regional leader. Um, they were, the judges were prophets. They had the gift of prophecy and they acted as prophets. In, in fact, actually, if you look at the classic um, uh, way that the Old Testament was divided up, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Jewish understanding, there were the former prophets and the latter prophets. The former prophets included Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings. All of that was in the former prophets. And then Isaiah, that's where you start with uh, the latter prophets. Uh, the judges would have been considered to be prophets. 
Um, but they were also political leaders. They, they, were, uh, they were people who would lead the nation uh, in, um, politically, lead them into battle even. Um, I think the best definition of a judge is probably given to us at Judges chapter 2, verse 16. It says this. Um, it's describing the, the difficult state that Israel is in at the moment. And it says, Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the hand of those who plundered them. The judges were those that God would individually raise up to deliver Israel at moments of crisis, turmoil, whatever. So they, they were national deliverers, national saviors. I think that's the best way to describe them. Um, we're going to have a lot more to say about the book of Judges and just sort of the general background information as we continue to work our way through the chapter. But I think it's probably best to just dive right in now. So let's start right off in, in verse 1. And, and um, I'm going to note that... that Chapter one is a lot of just um, kind of factual, geographic, biographical information. And we're just going to uh, plod straight through it. And one of the things that I, I hope that you notice, because it, it can come across as a bit dull, so-and-so took this and then so-and-so captured that. But one of the things I hope you notice as we're working our way through this chapter one is how Judges is showing us this moment of fruition, this moment of completion, where all of these things that had been previously promised in, um, in the first couple books of, of the, or in the first couple yeah, books of the Bible, in, uh, you know, beginning with Abraham, promises made to Abraham, they're all becoming fulfilled in these little moments that initially just strike you as just an interesting random fact, but suddenly you realize, oh, this was prophesied, this was promised. And I hope that you can see that all of the fulfillment that is, that is really coming to fruition in just in chapter one of Judges. Now, chapter one starts off with this. Um, After the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, who shall be the first to go up for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? Um, it's an interesting way to start the book, after the death of Joshua. But actually, that's a, that's a really common way. Um, if you think about it, how many books of the Bible start with that. Exodus begins with the death of Joseph. Joshua begins with the death of Moses. Uh, Judges here begins with the death of Joshua. First Kings begins with the death of David. This is actually a really common way because um, you have the, uh, a, um, a really important figure, an important ruler of some sort who dies and it, um, and it you know, throws everybody. Who's, who, what's, what's next? And it's this really important moment of transition. So the, the death of Joshua marks a transition point, the beginning of a new era. Um, Judges 1 and 2, these two chapters, are an introduction to this new era. Um, one of the things you'll notice as we're going through um, Joshua 1, if you don't catch this, you're going to get kind of confused. Um, Joshua 1 is not written in a strictly chronological order. Okay, it's more of a, a summary of the situation that the Israelites now find themselves in. It's not strictly chronological. So for instance, um, Joshua died at the end of chapter 24 uh, in, in the book of Joshua. So the last few verses of the book of Joshua, Joshua dies. And then Judges 1 starts right off with saying, now after the death of Joshua. But then you're going to continue on, and in Judges chapter 2, verses 6 through 10, we're going to, find it, we're going to hear about the death of Joshua. Right? So, so clearly, it, it, this isn't a strict chronological order here. Um, it's, it's a summary of the situation that Israel finds themselves in at this, uh, at this point, the beginning of the, the period of the judging of judges. Um, so the point is not to provide a strict chronology, but a big picture summary of the situation. Um, and in order to do so, it also recapitulates a lot of what was going on at the end of the book of Joshua. So we're going to retell a lot of the stories that were going on in Joshua are going to be retold at the beginning of Judges. And what we find out is, okay, so Joshua has died. It's time to conquer this land. And the question is, who is supposed to go up first? Um, it's interesting also to notice here that Moses had appointed Joshua to be his leader, but Joshua has not appointed a clear successor to him. There's not one person who's now leading Israel. And so it, 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 you know, it, it starts off with saying, um, the children of Israel asked the Lord. It's like there, there's not a, a true king or leader that unifies them all. They just, as a nation, say who should go up first. 
Um, there is no successor that has been appointed. We just have the people with no clear leader over all of Israel coming to the Lord. And they, uh, they, the people come, they ask the Lord, and I think presumably this means that they sent a contingent to the tabernacle to inquire from the high priest, you know, probably using the Urim and the Thummim uh, for direction. So they're, they're inquiring uh, at, the, at the tabernacle, uh, you know, God lead us. Who should be sent to go up first? And we're told in verse 2 that the answer is Judah. Judah is the one that's supposed to go first. Um, here, to, the, to this extent, we are getting a little bit of chronology. We do know that Judah is supposed to go first. Um, and it's not surprising that it's Judah that's chosen to go first. If you go back to the Exodus, and you remember, they're, they're really specific about what order the tribes are supposed to march in. And one of the things you'll find out is that Judah always is supposed to be at the front. Um, it's the head of Judah, Nashon, during the Exodus that, that walks in front of uh, Israel and is, I'm assuming it's Nashon's feet who, who hit the, the sea first when the waters parted. Uh, but it's always Judah that is selected to go first, royal uh, Judah, and it's the same thing here. Judah is supposed to go first, and Judah really leads throughout chapter 1. I mean, the, most of chapter 1 is about Judah, Judah's conquest, Judah's faithfulness, Judah's victories. All right, verse 3, we're told here, it says, So Judah said to Simeon, his brother, Come up with me to my allotted territory, that we might fight against the Canaanites, and I will likewise go with you to your allotted territory. So when, when Judah goes to march into battle, Simeon pairs up with him and, and, and goes with him. This makes sense for a couple of reasons. First, um, we know that um, if you just go back to Joshua 19, verse 9, remember that the, the land of Canaan has been all divided up, and each tribe has been given a different section. Listen to verse 9 here in, in Joshua 19. The inheritance of the children of Simeon was included in the share of the children of Judah. For the share of the children of Judah was too much for them. Therefore, the children of Simeon had their inheritance within the inheritance of that people. So it, it makes sense that Simeon and Judah would partner up because Simeon's inheritance was actually inside of the land of Judah. And we're told, first of all, that because Judah was given this large chunk of land that was too much for them, but also, if you go back into the book of Numbers when the um, tribes are counted, there's kind of a census, we'll see that Simeon was by far the smallest tribe, was teeny by this point. And so that also makes sense. They're a small tribe, so they're given a little piece inside of Judah. And that's why Judah and Simeon pair up to go into the land um, together. Um, Simeon was included inside of Judah, thus their cooperation with each other makes good sense. And you will see Simeon slowly become swallowed up by Judah over the next few centuries so that you no longer really refer to the tribe of Simeon. It's just Judah. This, though, if you, if you go back a little bit further, there's another element of this that really also makes sense. Go all the way back to the book of Genesis. Um, do you remember in Genesis 34 the story of the Dina incident? Um, Shechem, who was a Hivite, has fallen in love with Dina. Um, uh, the, the daughter of Jacob, and has fornicated with her. Her two brothers, Simeon and Levi, to get revenge for this, um, this evil that's been done to their sister, they promise her in marriage to Shechem if he and all his people will become circumcised. And then they take that moment immediately after they've been circumcised and are weakened, have not yet recovered, they take that moment to attack and kill them all. And if you remember, Jacob is horrified that they've done this. He says, you made us a, um, a, a curse in this land, and this was terrible that you did this. And in Genesis um, chapter 49, at the very end of Jacob's life, remember he gives sort of um, blessings, curses, maybe just prophecies about each of his sons. And in verse 7, he says this. Verses 5 through 7 are about Simeon and Levi. And he describes that sin that they did, this, this terrible thing that they did. And then he says this, Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. The, the, the consequence of this is that they're going to be spread inside of Israel, scattered and spread. And if you think about it, it's really interesting because Levi is selected to become a priest, and therefore <laughs> Levi is not given any land in Israel. Levi is scattered throughout Israel. And Simeon, as we see right here, becomes too small and is put inside of Judah and is scattered throughout Judah. 
This is what I mean by we're seeing right now in Judges 1 the fulfillment of all these prophecies and promises that had happened all the way back in, in, in the book of uh, Genesis. Levi becomes priest throughout all of Israel. Simeon is placed inside of Judah and swallowed up by Judah. It's also interesting because in one sense it was a curse because they don't get any land and sort of spread throughout Israel. But in another sense, there's actually kind of like a hidden blessing here. There, um, there, there's a gift that they've been given. We're gonna, because all the northern tribes are going to fall away, but it's the southern, it's being inside of Judah that actually preserves their uh, existence, their continued existence. They're put in the place that's going to be faithful. And so there, there's actually, it's kind of a weird thing because it's both a, a curse, but also a little bit of a blessing inside of it. So anyhow, Simeon goes up along with Judah to go and inherit the land. Uh, in verse 4, we're, we're told, they, they go, it's, you should note the verb there, and Judah went up. It's a particular Hebrew verb that describes not just going, but going up. They, they, they go up. They're headed up into the hill country of Judah, um, where they will fight the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Um, and, and we know that at this time, God um, blesses them with a, a great victory. They kill 10,000 of their enemy uh, in, in one swoop. Uh, and it's at this time that they capture um, Adonai Bezek, which uh, Adonai just means Lord. So Adonai Bezek just means he's the king of Bezek. He's the Lord Bezek. He's the local ruler. And, and we get this, um, he, he tells us this story about how he had captured 70 kings over the course of his time and had chopped off all of their thumbs and their big toes and these 70 kings lived under his table eating scraps from his table. That is just straight out of a, a nightmare. I don't know. I, I can remember as a kid just the idea of like eating dinner and then like looking under the table and 70 people with no thumbs or, or toes eating your scraps. It's creepy. Um, anyhow, he, he remembers this, and there's this, there's this um, divine retribution, um, and uh, that, that this is what is now done to him. And pretty much every commentary I read described this as an act of Israel executing um, faithfully an eye for an eye judgment, an eye for an eye vengeance. Um, that's what, what he did to others has now been done to him. I, I, I kind of question that a little bit, though, and would push against that, because we need to remember the specific commandment that Israel was given as they were sent into the promised land. And this, this commandment is important for framing our whole understanding of Joshua chapter, or excuse me, Judges 1. We need, in order to understand what's going on in Judges 1, we need to remember what were the orders, what were the marching orders that they were given. Remember that God brought Abraham, Abram at this time, into this exact land, this exact place, um, hundreds of years before, centuries before. And he promised uh, Abram that he would inherit all of it. He names the tribes that are, that are um, the, the seven nations that are inhabiting the land. And he says, you're going to take all of this. But he tells him, in Genesis 15, 16, as for you, you should go to your fathers in, uh, in peace. You should be buried at, at an old age. But in the fourth generation, they should return here, uh, your, gener your descendants. Your descendants will return here. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Now, there's, there's seven nations here that are described, the Parasites, the Hivites, and whatnot, the Jebusites. Um, and, they're off, and the Amorites are one of the tribes, but the, fra the word Amorites is often used to describe the totality of them. It's a description of all of them. Amorites, particularly early on, they're all described under the heading of Amorites. The same thing happens later where even though Canaanites is one of the smaller little nations, Canaanites later comes to describe all of them. Uh, they're, they're all Canaanites in one way or another. So he uses the Amorites here, I think, as a general summary. But he says, God tells Abram, I'm going to give you all this land, but these people, their iniquity does not yet merit the kind of judgment that will come. But a, a time will come when their iniquity is so high that it will merit a certain kind of exceptional and fierce judgment that is, that, is, that is to come. There was a certain level of wickedness that merited total destruction, and they weren't there yet. But by the time of the Exodus, they were there. If you look at um, Deuteronomy chapter 7, I'll start at verse 1. 
When the Lord your God brings you into the land which you go to possess and has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations, those are the seven nations, um, seven nations greater and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God delivers them over to you, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, nor show mercy to them, nor shall you make marriages with them. You shall not give your daughter to their son or take their daughter to your son, for they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. So the anger of the Lord your God will be aroused against you and destroy you suddenly. Okay, it's a very fierce and extreme commandment, but he says they are to be utterly destroyed. There can be no um, bargaining. There can be no mercy shown. They are not to remain in your land in any way whatsoever. Uh, make no covenant with them. Make no peace with them. They are to be utterly destroyed. These are the seven nations, um, these are the seven tribes that are in the promised land that are be, to be completely destroyed. Note that um, uh, the command is repeated again in Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 16 and 17. But of the cities of these people, which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance, you shall let nothing that breathes remain alive, but you shall utterly destroy them, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, just as the Lord your God has commanded you, lest they teach you to do according to all their abominations, which they have done for their gods, and you sin against the Lord your God. So once again, you're to leave no one alive. The command was to leave nothing. Um, why? Why? Why such a fierce and terrible uh, commandment? This is, uh, you, you'll see people refer to this as the harem uh, ban. Harem is the, the Hebrew word that just describes this total destruction that they were, um, that they were assigned to. A determination that something was to be totally and mercilessly destroyed. Some enemies you could conquer and you, could, um, you might beat them in battle, but after the battle, a peace would be arrived at and you could, their plunder was yours. Uh, you, you would, uh, they would enslave the people and whatnot. But these seven nations, were it was to be a total and complete annihilation. It was different than any other victory that they might receive. Why, um, why is that okay? Because that, that seems particularly um, fierce and grotesque in, in, in uh, battle. First, we should note that um, while we, men, we do not have a right to make that kind of decision uh, for someone else, but God does have a right to make that kind of decision. This is something that's well within God's sovereign authority to do. Man does not have a right to order this, but God does have a right to order it. Remember how we walk through the gospel. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. The, the, the just payment for our sin is death. We, um, we believe that when we walk through the gospel, but it's hard for us to really stomach the thought that actually as we look around us, everybody here could be justly executed, like justly a death sentence for their sin. Now God has not, in his mercy, has not given the authority yet for all of us to be executed in that way. But it is a right thing. It, it, it is a fair thing before God. Our gut um, revulsion against that is, um, is our inner Pelagian misbehaving. Our, our, our inner Pelagian, that little guy inside of you that says, no, you actually are precious and worth something. And these, surely that is uh, uncomfortable and surely that can't actually be true. Now, now this fact that, that God would have a right to, to strike any of us down, that's not something for any of us to exult in. It's not something for us to become uh, proud or, or casual with because it's something that condemns each of us as well. You can't, you can't point out uh, the, the, this right judgment that God could have on somebody else without also making that same argument for yourself. Um, our response then should be humility and gratitude at God's mercy while also glorifying him for his righteousness. Um, I, I think that we need to make sure that we, we take seriously the consequences in the Garden of Eden, that dying, you will die. That, that death is on us and death is right for us. The fact that we've not been struck down is we live inside the breath of God's um, continued mercy. Second, we should also see the explanation that God gives for why he is giving this severe ban. 
And again, uh, Deuteronomy 7, uh, listen to verses 4 through 8. Well, listen to just verse 4. Um, you're, not to, you're not to make peace with them. And then he says in verse 4, For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods, so that the anger of your Lord will be aroused against you and destroy you suddenly. If you allow them to live, they will turn you away. They, they will, they will t- take you away from God. If you show mercy here, your mercy is not godly mercy. It's fleshly mercy. And if you do not, if you do not act with the seriousness that God has commanded you, then it's going to undermine your family and your sons will be taken away from you. Listen to, um, again to Deuteronomy 20, verse 18. Same, same thing repeated there. Lest they teach you to do according to all their abominations which they have done for their gods, and you sin against the Lord your God. If you allow them to continue, they will take you away from God. They will, they will lead you astray. And if you think about that, that means that this heavy judgment that God has, has commanded them to execute is actually a function of God's mercy and his kindness on Israel and his desire to preserve them. It's a, it's a severe thing that I command you to, but if you will be faithful with this severe commandment, what you will discover is God's mercy and his blessing in your life. It, he will preserve you uh, from turning away. And again, go on in, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, listen to verse 7. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor cho- choose you, because you were more in number than any other people. For you were the least of all peoples, but because the Lord loves you, because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand. It, this is a really important thing to make sure that you understand when you're in the midst of, of thinking through this kind of judgment. Why is it that Israel is given the privilege of, of executing this judgment, but without having this judgment executed on them? Is it because that's a kind of distinction that immediately goes to your head? Obviously, it's because we're the righteous people. It's because we're the perfect people. It's because we're the people that has clearly deserved this kind of distinction. And he stops them and he says, no, there's nothing you have done to earn this distinction. This distinction is God's mercy. It's simply the fact that he has decided to give you his love, to give you his covenant. And you live inside of his covenant. That's why you get this privilege. It's the love of God, not the the worth of the people that has made this distinction. So again, what you see as initially, it's like that's a really hard thing to say. What you see in it is the mercy and kindness and love of God in such a judgment. So so Israel was supposed to give Adonai Bezek God's justice, but what did they do? Well, if you think about it, what they did was they gave him Canaanite justice. They did, what, they did to him what the Canaanites like to do. And I think that there is an, an, an initial, and it's probably just very slight, but there's an initial perversion, an initial shifting from what would God have us do to what do, what do these people, how do they handle justice? How do they handle judgment? And I think that this, there's an initial sort of faithlessness here that allows Adonai Bezek to continue on, where they kept a trophy king from a nation that they were supposed to exterminate. They keep this little trophy hanging on. Um, As the Canaanites did to their conquered kings, so they did to Adonai Bezek. He's not executed. We find out that he subsequently dies in Jerusalem. They take him on to Jerusalem, and that's where he dies. We're not sure how long it is that he lives, but it's not a result of an execution like they were supposed to. Um, We see they continue on. Verse 8. Um, in verse 8, they take Jerusalem, which was, um, if you look at the allocations of the property, Jerusalem was actually just inside of Benjamin's territory. Um, and, um, and, and Judah takes Jerusalem, they burn it, but we don't hear anything after that. until And then all of a sudden, a little bit later on, we find out that Benjamin has tried to take Jerusalem, uh, but has failed. So it looks like Judah takes it and then kind of moves on and leaves it handed over to Benjamin, and Benjamin is not able to hang on to it. And when Benjamin can't hang on to it, it's with the Jebusites that they're they're struggling. Remember, the Jebusites are one of those seven nations that they were supposed to completely push out. Benjamin can't do it. We'll see that again um, in a little bit. So they've gone up in verses 3 through 8. They've gone up into the hill country, and now in verse 9, they, they turn and they start to go down. Uh, now they're going down to the lowlands to the south. Um, Hebron is the same 
this, this uh, in, in verses 9 on, it's the same story that's told in Joshua 15, uh, which again lets us know this chapter is a recapitulation of the conquest. And I think one of the things you'll notice as we work through this is that the, this is organized more by geography than chronology. And what I mean by that is as we keep going through this, what you're going to see is that we go from the south all the way up to the north. And if you can, if you can do this and make sense of that little map that I gave you, um, hopefully you can see some of the names there and understand that we're starting with Judah in the south and we're pushing our way north. Um, Caleb goes to take this. Caleb, who had first spied out the land, leads Judah into this conquest. First, they take Kirjath Arba, uh, which is Hebron. Um, Heb- Hebron will later be David's capital city until he takes Jerusalem. And he'll, when he takes Jerusalem, he'll take it from the Jebusites who pushed Benjamin out. But Hebron will be David's capital city later on until he moves on to Jerusalem. Um, in Joshua, we're told, Joshua 14, verse 15, the name of Hebron formerly was Kirjath Arba. Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. So Kirjath Arba, Arba is the greatest of the Anakim, the giants. Or again, a chapter later in Joshua 15, 13, it says, Now to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he gave a share among the children of Judah, according to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua, namely Kirjath Arba, which is Hebron. And then it says, Arba was the father of the Anak. So Arba, where Hebron is, Kirjath Arba, is where Arba is, and he is the father of the Anakim. This is where all of the giants are. Um, Arba was the father of the Anakim, and Kirjath Arba was a center for the Anakim. Caleb was specifically given Hebron. So as they're coming in, they they say to Caleb, you get to take Hebron. And that's a really great um, conclusion to what had started, uh, you know, 40 years before. Um, Quick side note, it's interesting to, uh, people don't realize this, that Caleb is not ethnically an Israelite. He's not an Israelite. He is a Kenizzite who was brought into Israel, his family was brought into Israel during the Exodus, okay? So he's actually a foreigner who's in the tri- working in the tribe of Judah, and I think it's one of the reasons why he has to be given a special allotment. Um, he is, but he's given an allotment inside of Judah because of his wholehearted devotion to God. And for Caleb, this is a great moment, because remember that Caleb was one of the spies that was sent into the, war- into the promised land, and he was the o- one of the only spies that encouraged Israel to not fear the giants in the land. Don't be scared of the giants. We need to take this. Caleb the Kenizzite had been kept alive for this moment. Um, what was it that had scared the Israelites back when they were scared to go into the promised land? Well, specifically, if you look at Numbers 13, 22, this is when they're spying out the land. Verse 22, it says, And they went through the south and came to Hebron. Ahaman, Shishai, and um, Talmai, the descendants of Anak, were there. The Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. Okay, he says, they they went to Hebron, and then it lists the names of three uh, Anakim giants that were there. And they're part of the things that scared everybody. But they're, they're, They're the source of fear for the Israelites for going into the promised land. Well, now we're told, as the Israelites finally approach, Caleb, you get to take Hebron. Um, If you look at Judges 1, verse 10, we see the great uh, fulfillment here. Then Judah went against the Canaanites who who dwelt in in Hebron. Now the name of Hebron was formerly Kirjath Arba, and they killed Shishai, Ahaman, and Talmai. Those are the three giants listed in numbers that freaked Israel out. And Caleb has been waiting this whole time, and they finally tell him, it's your turn, you get to go and do it. And he finally finishes what, what should have been done back in numbers. Uh, now he gets the privilege of doing. He gets to finish what had been started. Next, Judah takes Kirjath Sefer, uh, later called Deber. Um, and we're, we're told that Caleb's younger brother, or perhaps his, his nephew, Othniel, gets to take it. And he's rewarded with Caleb's daughter, Aksa, for a wife. Uh, and you get that great account of Aksa, this wise woman who knows how to handle herself, um, who knows how to increase the deal a little bit. He says, you've given me this great land. She calls it the land of the south, but south is, is Negev, which is also desert. I think she might be implying that this is really dry land, <coughs> and it needs water. And so she gets a couple of wells along, or springs along with it. It's good to note Othniel because he's going to show up as our first judge in Judges chapter 3. 
The descendants of Moses' father-in-law, verse 16, the Kenites, another non-Jewish group that had joined the Israelites in Exodus. Uh, uh, They're a Midianite tribe that Moses invited to join them back in Numbers chapter 10. Um, They've been waiting in the city of Palms, but now they come up and they join Judah, uh, uh, settling a rod in the south. Then they take, verse 17, Zephath, and they they name it Horma. Horma is a variation of Harem, that that word that means, um, you know, complete and total devotion. So Horma is this city that's been devoted to destruction. And then in verse 18, they take Gaza, Ashkelon, Ekron, cities of the Philistines. Um, Doesn't call it Philistine cities here right now, and it's a little bit strange because it's right at this moment that the Philistines are arriving probably from, from Greece. Uh, but they take those cities initially, even though later on they're going to become Philistine cities that they're constantly fighting against. In summary, though, verses 19 through 20, Judah and Simeon conquer much, but have to stop short as the Canaanite chariots of the low country are too much for them. Uh, we're told that God was with them, verse 19, but the chariots of iron stopped them. Um, and it's a real turning point in Judges, um, in the Judges' account of the conquest of the Promised Land, because it's been really successful at the front end, but now all of a sudden we start to see this fading success. And it, and it pivots. So you see in verse 21, now we're going to go through all the other tribes. And if you're looking at the map, what you'll see is that we're going from Judah in the south. And we're slowly kind of marching our way to the north. But Benjamin had been, um, first of all, Jerusalem, or excuse me, Judah took um, the city of Jerusalem, but then left it over to the Benjamites. And what we find in verse 21 is that Benjamin tried to settle the city but they were not able to do it. And so they, they just um, acquiesce and they mix with the Jebusites. Again, the Jebusites are one of the seven nations they were supposed to drive out, but the Benjamites make peace with them. They were commanded to destroy them completely, but they make peace with them. Um, in verses 22 through 29, the sons of Joseph, Ephraim uh, and uh, Manasseh, they, they're able to take Bethel, and we're told it was once called Luz, and the, te- the text tells us that they had help from within, this guy who comes and tells them how to get into the city. So they're able to take Bethel, and we should notice Bethel is um, the location where Abraham built an arch altar. This is where Jacob slept, had the vision of the ladder. That happened at, at Bethel. It's Jacob who names the place Bethel, house of God, after his vision. So the conquest of Bethel is significant, but they immediately falter after this. Verses 27 through 28, Manasseh fails to drive out the Canaanites. Verse 29, Ephraim does the same. Um, You start to see this among them. They they just kind of lived among them. They come to peace with these people. Uh, Even though they were commanded, don't make a covenant with them, they start to settle. Zebulon, uh, verse 30, they fail and they acquiesce to commingling. Verse 31 to 32, Asher, same fails. Verse 33, Naphtali fails. Um, and, and again, we're working our way north, and that's why this chapter 1 is arranged more geographically than chronologically. Um, and, and what we see is Judah is the most faithful, and the northern tribes get worse the further you go north. So Judah is the most faithful, but as we go to the north, you finally hit Dan at the very tippy top. Verses 34 through 36, we're told that Dan is the greatest failure. Dan, not just, they don't just like make peace with uh, the Amorites there. Dan is actually driven into the hill country because they can't defeat the Amorites at all. These are the Amorites that Joshua had defeated with the sun standing still in Josh 10, in, in that exact same place. Joshua had had this victory over them, and now Dan can't stand against them at all. So the thing that we need to notice is that Um, And and this is really important to understand this distinction. Defeat in battle was not the problem. It's not a problem there was a defeat in the battle. The problem was making peace with the defeat. Um, The fact that they were shut down isn't a problem. The problem is that they made peace with the defeat. Listen to Exodus 23. As God is getting them ready for this. Verses 23 and 24. My angel will go before you and bring you in to the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, and the Canaanites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. You shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do according to their works, but you shall utterly overthrow them and completely break down their secret pillars. They were, they were supposed to, in this order, we've got, received a number of times, you're supposed to go and completely wipe them out. But then if you keep going, verse 27, he says this, 
I will send my face, my fear before you. I will cause confusion among all the people to whom you come and will make all your enemies turn their back to you. And I will send hornets before you, which will drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, and the Hittite before you. I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. Little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and you inherit the land. Keep going a little bit further. You shall make no covenant with them, nor with their gods. They shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. So the progress was supposed to be slow. They were told at the beginning, you're not going to win every single battle, and you're not going to win it all at once. But you are to never make peace with the defeat. There will be times when you'll be stopped, but you cannot make peace with that moment. At no point, as, as God is pacing you, because he's growing you as he moves you forward, at no point do you make peace with where you are. Okay, The progress will be slow because as God is destroying your enemies before you, he is also growing you up. He's telling the Israelites, you're not ready for it. But don't take these, these, these um, challenges that are put in front of you as, as stops that you have to make peace with and just settle there. Um, so... You're going, to, you're going to keep going. You'll be paused. But every time you're paused, he says, make no covenant with them. Do not settle with that situation. And I think, so the obvious, it, it's quite an obvious application to us. You can see, because you can see this in your own life. Take that lesson and consider the battles that God has placed before you. What sin are you working to mortify? What battle have you not yet been given victory in? And then here is the convicting question. Have you used the fact that you have not been given victory yet to grow complacent? Do you, do you when, when you find that, okay, I failed there again, have you quit trying because clearly God does not intend to give you this victory? Do you, do you find yourself just like, I'm just going to give in to where I am right now? Have you made a forbidden peace with the Canaanites? Um, have you taken their tribute? Or worse yet, are you driven into the hills like the tribe of Dan with you paying tribute to your sin? Think of, think of we've got basically a spectrum and the land of Israel is a spectrum with Judah in the south, you know, Ephraim moving up and Dan in the north. And these are different levels of basically you compromising with your sin. You can have all the way at the south, you can have mostly faithful Judah who just has thumbless kings under the table, right? Do you, are you keeping sins, little thumbless kings under, under your table that, that for the most part outwardly all is success, but you've got somebody with no toes eating scraps under the table that nobody sees because you keep them under the, the table? Or, or do you move slowly up to levels of compromise like Ephraim where you just kind of in, intermingle freely or then you can go all the way to Dan where basically you've just quit trying, you're hiding in the hills, they can have it all because you kind of have just rolled over in fighting that sin. Those are the various, that's the scale of compromise that Israel uh, gives uh, to us. But you need to understand, you are the people of God. Um, he has named the tribes that he has commanded you to go and put to death. Listen to Colossians 3. You know, you think of that, that, that harem ban, that um, devoted to destruction. Uh, we think, oh, what, what would it be like to be an Israelite in those days to be told, go, and just kill everything. Well, listen, therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. You've been given your Canaanites to slay, and you've been told, put them to total death. Completely kill them all. There's your harem ban that, that you've been commanded to make. You're commanded uh, to put them totally to death. Do not take tribute from them. Do not make peace with them. Do not cohabitate with them. Do not even let them live thumbless and toeless under your table. You put them to death. And the fact that they do not die immediately is not your concern. Uh, the fact that they do not d die immediately is not a refutation or, or, or a revelation of a problem in the command that you've been given. Okay? It, do it, doesn't, it doesn't cancel the command. The fact that they do not die immediately is not your concern. Don't worry about that. You've been told to keep going, keep fighting, and let God dictate the pace that these things die as you occupy the promised land. In God's mysterious purposes, their iron chariots may have turned you back yesterday. 
It, it, and, and that is God's business as he paces your growth and your maturity in Christ. But you are commanded to still marshal your armies today and attack again. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we take your word to heart now and consider in our lives where we've made an unholy peace with our sin instead of fighting it to the death. Father, we know that your timing is perfect and where we have grown impatient in the pace of our sanctification, we confess this sin to you. Where we have perhaps even given up on our sanctification or given up on the possibility of victory over our sin, we confess this hopelessness to you. <coughs> we thank you for Caleb, the Kenizzite. We thank you for a man, a stranger by birth, but adopted into your family by faith. We thank you for his victory through wholehearted faith. And we ask that he would stand as a model for us and for the faith that we have been called to. May we walk like Caleb in the week ahead and may the sons of Anak flee before us. We pray these things that your son taught us to pray, saying... In Luke chapter 12, Jesus gives us two commands. One is to fear. The other is to fear not. And this isn't a case of speaking out of both sides of his mouth. Rather, there is a vital lesson that he is teaching us. He first tells his disciples that while they shouldn't fear man, who can kill the body but not the soul, they must fear the Lord. For it is he who determines not only the day of our physical death, but who also will cast rebellious souls into hell. Our life and eternity, in other words, are in his hands. And this should startle us to reflect on whether we are right with God. In other words, do not fear man, but do fear God Almighty. But this fear of God is not a sort of sheer terror. We know this because Jesus brings the conversation back around to this word of gentle comfort. Fear not. Little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. While God is justified in damning rebellious men to eternal hellfire, don't miss the logic of our Lord here. This fearful damnation need not be your end. God delights, and in fact, it is his good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And so Jesus' words come as a mercy. Fear not, little flock. Fear man, and you will find yourself terrified of God. But fear God, and you'll find all your fears assuaged. God is your maker and judge, yes. But through Christ, he is also the justifier of those who come to him by faith. Here at this table is a pledge that God the Father has given to you the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of endless joy, peace, and rest. And so to those who come to him, he says to them, fear not. And so come in faith and welcome to Jesus Christ. Let's pray and give thanks. Our God and Father, we thank you that by your Son, whose blood was shed, whose body was broken there upon Calvary's tree, you have welcomed us in to feast at your table, to partake of your great goodness to us. And we thank you that by the Spirit, you assure our hearts that this is for us, that you speak these kind words of gentle comfort to us. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. We give thanks now in Jesus' name, and amen. So the charge for the week ahead, which I know is weird and probably only makes sense if you've heard this sermon, but leave no thumbless kings under your table. <laughs> Check under the table, make sure there aren't any there. If they are, kill them. <laughs> so receive the, the benediction of God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Yeah.